Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm going to get us started because it looks like we're just a minute past uh, 1230 Pacific. So welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Gina Romano, and uh, I am going to be the moderator for this session. Before I introduce our amazing panelists, though, um, I'll give you a bit of my background. So I'm the head of human resources for Centerfield Media. I'm based in sunny Los Angeles, California, and I've been with the group for about three years. And uh, I really do feel like time flies when you're having fun because it feels like three days ago I started with this company. Um, for context, our employee population consists of about 2,000 employees. That's 300 in the U.S. and uh, the balance in Jamaica with a small handful of employees based in the UK. Um, so now I'd love for our panelists to introduce themselves. And additionally, in return for their time today, um, we will be donating to a charity of their choice. So please, uh, May, if you'd like to start, I'd love for you also to share what charity you've selected and why. Yay, thank you, Gina. Um, hi, everybody. I'm very excited to be here, uh, Gina and Michael and, and you all. Um, my name is May. I am the CEO and uh, co-founder of a company called Writer. We're an AI writing assistant for teams with some incredible Twitter and Intuit uh, and non-tech like uh, and uh, the uh, project um, that uh, I have chosen um, is a project called uh, the Sentencing Project. They do incredible work. I first heard about them uh, during the uh, BLM protests last year. Um, and, you know, they are all about the data, um, do a lot of uh, testifying, Congress, federal and state, um, and have added so much to the conversation to help change hearts and minds and get actual results in terms of um, reducing and overturning um, uh, extreme sentencing. So uh, that is me, and uh, that, that is Sentencing Project. Great, thank you so much, May. And uh, Michael, if I can call you Mike, I would love for you to introduce yourself next, and uh, please speak to the charity that you'll be donating to also. Great, thank you, Gina. And yeah, Mike is completely okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, my name is Michael Jester. I am the VP of operations for uh, Money Penny. Uh, we are a premier telephone answering service that's based out of the UK and now have a presence in the US. We have about uh, 1,200 employees globally, and we kind of are different uh, from a lot of when you think of call centers in that uh, we uh, we have a personal assistant that is really takes up about 20 percent of the calls for you. And so it's about that relationship. The other 80% are answered by uh, the, the, the team. And so, again, it really is about building the, that relationship and how we uh, answer calls for our clients. Uh, and here in the U.S., we're based, you said you're in sunny Los Angeles. We're in Polony, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So every day we go out, the, the, our cars are yellow from the pollen. So uh, the charity mm -hmm. that, that I chose is We Mind the Gap. And this was founded, it's in the U.K., and what it does, it gives opportunities to young adults that maybe didn't get a, a fair chance uh, for whatever reason uh, in, in life uh, to, to the point of adulthood. And so while they're still young adults, uh, the, We Mind the Gap, what they do is they, they fill that gap with love, support, care, training. Uh, they, they train them in, in life skills as well as professional skills, and uh, then put them into uh, holistic paid tra traineeships. Uh, about 70% of the graduates of the program still remain uh, successfully employed and engaged in society. And for every dollar invested, it, it uh, offsets about $3.60 in social value because we take them off the books of, of uh, for instance, government uh, support and things. So, uh, yeah, it's a great, uh, great charity. Thank you for, for giving to them. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. And I have to ask before we get started, Mike, is that your guitar on the wall? It is. This is my office and these are my guitars. I cannot play worth anything. Uh, but yes, those are my guitars on the wall. So <laughs> yes, uh, we like to have fun in the office. Very cool. Very cool. 
Uh, well, let's jump into things here. So, you know, in my three years at Centerfield, I've implemented five different platforms to realize some very necessary HR efficiencies. Um, the three big players that we implemented were a new applicant tracking system, Lever, a new human capital management system, Ultimate Software, and an international payroll provider called ActivePay. And uh, between those three um, that we implemented, you know, it was a ton of work, a ton of time, but just crucial to the business. Um, and so, May, I'm curious, you know, what platforms do you use? Any products that overlap with the ones that I said uh, today? Yeah. Um, so I, um, as the CEO and, you know, um, obviously have been the CEO since the beginning because I'm also the co-founder. Um, uh, we have seen uh, a real and very fast um, kind of transition from the tools um, uh, over time. So just a few short years, um, we went from um, Gusto to Namely to Rippling. <laughs> Um, and um, the, the, the initial choice for uh, Gusto, um, you know, they themselves are going up market, but started as SMB and really focused on tech and startups. Um, and so that was um, a bit of a no brainer to start with Gusto um, as uh, kind of our, our payroll and H all in one HR solution. All in one um, definitely didn't exist really until um, uh, kind of namely and Rippling came on the scene. So even Gusto, you know, saw itself as a um, payroll solution when we first adopted it. Um, but the, um, uh, the reason we moved off of Gusto to uh, namely initially was account for remote employees. Um, so we are, our engineering has been digital first from day one. Um, we've got um, engineer, dozens of engineers in just as many countries. I think Ukraine might be the only place where we've got, you know, more than one FTE. Um, and uh, and Namely was really able to do that. Um, the other big reason we moved off Augusto, and now they do this too, was benefits. Um, so, you know, as we grew as a company, um, you know, the perks with the job um, improved. And, um, you know, everything from 401k matching to um, better health, dental, vision, all of those good things. And that all now comes um with with namely again you know i know gusto has gone up market as well but um uh, they didn't have those features when when we switched so the move to namely was really driven by our head of ops and um for folks who have sold to startups um you know titles in the growth stage really are different but basically who is the person who is sort of like the second brain to the founders that's the person who is going to buy hr software um, because we may have folks who are doing recruiting, we may have folks who are doing onboarding, but it is unlikely before, you know, 80 people that you've got somebody in HR who's doing like the software and the HR ops separate from the person who's doing just general biz ops. Um, and so, you know, sub 100, if there are folks on the phone who are selling to those people, you know, find the CEO's proxy in the org and that's the buyer. Um, so in our case, uh, it was an amazing um, woman named Maiko who um, uh, said, May, if you want to do all this stuff and get all these people on board, we got to move to Namely. Um, and so she spearhead that whole process. Um, now, as we've grown, we now have a head of finance and the move from Namely to Rippling um, was driven by, you know, the head of finances, P1s. Um, and so you know, one of the first things he did when he came on board about a year ago was basically audit all of our software and SaaS spend. And it was like, um, wait a minute, you know, we still got Gusto over here because we're using it for contractors in Europe. Um, uh, here's here's kind of an all in one solution. And guess what? It's cheap. we were out of the IT and security team um, for device management. Um, that now rippling like that's an all in one to a whole other level um, has has implemented. So I know we'll get into all of this stuff, but that's kind of been like our, our journey of the most, um, you know, highest spend um, HR software categories. Um, we were one of like four people who you go hire as an 
NTS. So I'm very happy to talk to you all about that. And then, you know, my co-founder and CTO being like, oh, they're never going to sunset this product. And, you know, they sunset the product. Um, and so that was that was fun. <laughs> That's great. And also, so interesting. No, so interesting. When I joined Centerfield, we were on Namely and Centerfield overnight went from a 40 person company to a 1000 person company. Wow. And, amazing. And, and, Name, and Namely is totally fine to let you know that, that, that you have outgrown them. And so when I joined, we were at that place where it was like they couldn't keep up with our payroll. They couldn't keep up with the needs of our business. And so that was kind of what caused the shift to a, a larger software that could support our needs. Um, Mike, how about you? Uh, what are the big platforms that you utilize? Sure. Currently, and, and we'll come back and I'll, I'll share more about what we currently use. We use uh, Paycom in the U.S. and plug it into a kind of a home built back end uh, that kind of covers both the U.K. as well as our U.S. offices that uh, uh, we've nicknamed uh, My Working Life. So uh, but uh, we uh, when I first came in last fall here, uh, we were had two locations in the U.S. We were on Paycom on one, Strovis on another. Uh and it just, uh, to your point, it didn't make sense to have multiple uh, multiple software, SaaS systems uh, working across those states. In the past, I've been at uh, uh, companies where we uh, used home bill systems along with ADP as kind of our payroll uh, solution, as well as you mentioned Ultima Software. We had uh, the last place I worked, we used uh, UltiPro. I think it's now what, UKG Pro, uh, but it was Ultima Software. So, what we found with Paycom in the U.S. for what we do uh, and how we use it, it uh, is a pretty full, robust system. It allows us to handle all the recruiting uh, information through the same platform. It allows us to do payroll, uh, track vacation, track uh, absences. It also allows us to do training videos to be HIPAA compliant uh, and check the box uh, for that all through the same software, uh, So, which is really great because that mm -hmm. takes a lot of the the, the work off of our marketing team to have to do separate videos. Then how do you track it? Is there an Excel sh sheet in the past? And, and so it allows us to really track it uh, uh, through there. Uh, and it, it truly is uh, a solution that works for us. And again, with the back end plug in, uh, that's more of kind of a culture piece uh, that I, you know, like, that I shared. Uh, it, it works great for us. I want to remind everybody that uh, questions are totally welcome. Throw a question up there, uh, ask a question in the chat. We are happy to answer those as well. Um, but I want to look at the pre-purchase purchasing decision a little bit and maybe what drives those decisions. Uh, I know for me, when I was researching which products to implement and those non-negotiables, um, you know, there were certain things that I, I, I couldn't part ways with. You know, they had to be flexible. They had to be able to grow and scale with us. The interface experience for the employees was the utmost importance for me because those are our customers and that's what matters is how they're going to interact with the system, how they're going to like the system. Um, so those were, I think, a couple of things that were really important for me. Mike, uh, you, you've gone through a lot of different systems. Sounds like what are maybe some of the big drivers that would determine your purchasing decisions? Sure. And you stole a bunch of them when you said just now. So, uh, you know, to, to your point, flexibility scalability. I mean, those are two huge ones. Ease of use, uh, because again, uh, if, if you have a program that works for your HR department, but doesn't work for your eight, for your frontline, your employees, it, it's not something that, that they're going to use to. Oh, Mike, I might've lost audio on you. May, maybe while he's uh, working through his audio issues, would you mind sharing what some of your pre-purchase drivers are that you take into account? Yeah, and maybe this is going to be contrarian, um, you know, and I hate saying this because we have a product in market that competes on ease of use and end user experience. But I got to tell you, when I first logged into Rippling, I was like, we chose this over Gusto and Namely. <laughs> and Gusto's, I mean, it, it was, it's, it's best, it's world class end user experience, right? And um, we just published a blog post around um, the, uh, uh, the business case for product delight, and that is a delightful product. Um, Rippling, not so, um, but you know, to where Michael was was Mike was going with um, with it, you know, it gave our team, our ops team, really the the flexibility, adaptability um, that we were looking for, and 
um, kind of the, the cost effectiveness um, that the team was optimizing for. What what made it best in class? What to you made it, you know, the, the cream of the crop? Um, so super easy to um, a, approve um, everything from, you know, uh, uh, requests to putting in time off all from your phone. Um, you know, everything like when you see a field that's pretty populated, it just felt like fewer clicks um, and more interest in copy and design, um, fewer paths to doing something. Um, uh, and it was just beautiful to look at. That's, that's kind of what I'm going for. And then I think namely, when, when I say ease of use, and then namely, I thought did a much better job um, than rippling at like sort of getting a little bit at like the social and cultural things that some other products do as standalone services, whereas like rippling doesn't even try, you know. Um, so I like knowing when work anniversaries were coming up and, you know, kind of softer things like that. And I felt like, you know, the end user experience at Namely and Gusto had that more as a um, um, as a job to be done. <laughs> yeah, as, a, as an added feature. And specifically in the Los Angeles market, I can tell you that, you know, the culture that, that you build within the company is such a an important factor and retention and, and, you know, building this cohesion among your employees. And I, I really do believe that the, whatever HCM that you use, uh, it plays such a big role in it. And to your point, to have recognition when somebody has an anniversary, it may even, especially if you grow big, right, you may have five anniversaries in a day, but for that one person, it feels really special. And I think that personalization, uh, it, it goes a long way. And I would all, you said something else that was interesting about, you know, being able to use your phone. How much weight do you put on the mobile aspect of it and it, and how easy it is to use to approve PTO on your phone, to be able to look at, you know, your salary on your phone? How much weight would you put on that, May? Well, so in our purchase decision, we literally put zero weight on it because we chose a solution that, um, you know, I don't even think they've got a mobile app yet. Um, the Namely mobile app was so seamless. It was amazing. Um, so, you know, really depends on the company and what they value at that time. Um, and, you know, I know from our own sales process, right, the thing that we are most trying to understand from somebody when they want to engage with us, we're completely inbound, um, is like, what are you, what's important to you? What are you trying to solve? Um, and, you know, for us, we weren't trying to optimize for like May Habib's CEO experience, you know? <laughs> Yes. Um, but I imagine that if we had like 50 managers, right, mobile experience would be absolutely critical because we want it to be easy for them to manage, you know, the admin aspects of their team. Yes, yeah, such a good point. Size plays a huge factor. Mike, are you back with us? Do we have audio? I think so. Can you guys hear me? Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So please, please continue on with yeah. you know, what your driving factors are. Sure. And, and the, the last one I was going to mention was integration. And you kind of hit on that, uh, with mobile, mobile app. And, and for us, when you, again, when you're looking at 1200 people across two countries, three states in the U S, uh, that is, it's huge. And, uh, being a, a telephone answering service, you, we're hiring a lot of people from the younger generation that, that everything mm -hmm. happens off their mobile device. So for us, it was a, it was a big factor that weighed in, uh, and, you know, a lot of companies are really scared about the, the trusting their employees to to use the mobile device to clock in. They're going to take advantage of it. But again, that's, I think that's where you mentioned the culture piece, Gina. That's where, you know, we're really big about the culture piece. And and for those that that still are worried about it, you know, there's geofencing uh, both in uh, in the Paycom app as well as as Ulti Pro in the past. So, I mean, those those options are available uh, that allow you to put parameters up and still uh, allow them to to use the mobile device and, 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 uh, to the, to, to its capacity. Uh, and, and it, to your, to your point, May, you know, uh, uh, through growth, allowing those managers, you know, with 1200, uh, people, we have a lot of managers have to go and improve payroll and, and allowing them that accessibility to, to check during the week and have it all done through mobile. Uh, I'd say that was a big factor in, in, in our decision to move off of Strovis and onto Paycom. So it sounds like as a whole, there are many factors that we take yeah. into account as decision makers. And 
really a lot of it depends on the size of your company, where you're going, the ability to be able to support those different types of workforces. Um, you know, I think one of a uh, very influential piece of this purchasing puzzle to me is the salesperson. And I don't know about you two, but every day my LinkedIn and my work email are absolutely flooded with people trying to sell me a product um, or trying to sell me something. And uh, it gets you, there's a fine line, I believe, between getting the information that you need when you're making a massive decision, like a human capital management system, for example, where you're going to be spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on this, on this product and, uh, being too pushy and just annoying the crap out of me. And so I know for me, um, that's one of the big things is the way that they massage the conversation with you. We're all so busy. Everybody's too busy these days. And so if they cross the line between making sure you have what you need, checking in um, to just being too pushy, uh, being a little bit too forceful in the sale. Um, you know, I've even had situations where the sales individual uh, brought in a gender like, is there somebody else that should be making this decision? And no, sir, it's actually me. And so that was for me, uh, non-negotiable. You're done. Yes. If you don't believe I'm making this decision, you're out. And so that was uh, one interesting piece for me. But uh, Mike, I would be interested, you know, for you, what makes you cross over from that maybe to an absolute yes? I think from maybe to yes, I think it's show me the blind spots. I'm open to listening. If you can show me the blind spots with what I current have with uh, that, maybe you're coming with a solution that uh, that that doesn't have those blind spots. Uh, you know, uh, I think. If you can show me again, the areas that we're missing, because to your point, when you're paying hundreds of thousand dollars for an ACM system and you are. You expect it, a return on that investment. And sometimes we get into it, we make a decision, and sometimes we realize, you know, we don't see that return. And and so uh, when we begin looking again, yeah, I think uh, to get my ear would be showing me the blind spots. If you want to lose my ear, it is, to your point, uh, harassing, overdoing it, uh, just almost becoming a stalker at times, uh, you know, just taking it too far. Uh, and to your point, uh, well, I've, to, I've never had anybody ask, you know, share like they did with you, but, but just really wanting to go around, above, under, uh, to try to, you know, play in almost a parent against a parent, uh, to try to get their, their solution in. I think that's a no go for me. Yeah. And May, how about for you? Um, that's very helpful um, uh, feedback from um, folks as I think about, you know, our sales processes, et cetera, taking notes, like make sure to never go around or above <laughs> or under somebody. <laughs> no, we have a great sales team, but it's just so great to hear, you know, unfiltered um, feedback from folks who get pitched a ton every single day. Um, I, I loved the show me the blind spot um, because Mike, you articulated something that for sure um, I hadn't put words to, but when I do find an interaction really valuable, that's really what somebody is doing. And um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about um, a decision we just made last week. Um, we went with uh, customer IO over iterable, not in the HR space, but for email marketing um, and like, Far and away, the iterable person was the standout um, and, um, you know, literally like taught me a ton, right? Helped us recruit for a role, super valuable throughout the whole process. Um, but just the product, you know, didn't do what we wanted it to do and required a bit more a technical lift, et cetera. Um, and, and team was familiar with um, the other tool more than their tool had used it in previous roles. Um, and we actually just um, lost a deal at NVIDIA um, to a competitor um, who, you know, the champion said, not nearly as good I know, and I'm paying up the wazoo, but I used it at AWS before, and I just like, I just kind of know what to do. Um, and so, you know, I think the, 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 you know, the big mantra, right, um, is if you don't lose some, then you're not in enough deals. So for folks on the line, like you gotta lose some to know that you're in the, you're really in the market. Um, and when somebody has, you know, shown me the blind spot, I 
still haven't necessarily purchased, right? Because yeah. um, of that. Um, but where I really appreciate the salesperson and we stay in touch, um, you know, there was a product I was kicking the tires on, you know, also in the marketing space last year, um, where I still like like that person sale that salesperson stuff. He still likes my stuff, you know. Um, so much of it has to do with the value. Um, you know, did they get you information that you did not have? And we are all so busy. If you come with information that is valuable to the role, to the person, where they are in their business and role today, right now, you will be unforgettable. Um, you won't be annoying. So like the real relationship building, um, you know, isn't, you know, um, discussion or conversation or weather or sports or where you went to school. I really think the currency is information. Agreed. And I'll follow up on something you said, May, really good, which is the relationship. There have been times where build relationships with somebody trying to sell something while it wasn't good for us, recommended it to someone else. And uh, so I would say don't give up on the relationship because just because you don't sell to me or May or Gina, we may think in our minds of we know someone in our network that they would be perfect for. Uh, And if you build that relationship, and I think the other thing you brought up, which is great, is uh, show me the why as well. Not just the what, not just the how. Everybody can tell me that, but the why. Uh, To me, that's super important. Such such good points by both of you and a couple of things that um, you brought up that I want to touch on. What what value when offices were open, what value did you put on individuals coming into your office and selling to you face to face versus continuing with maybe an email marketing or LinkedIn uh, technique? Did you find that you historically would be more influenced in person um, or was there really no difference? And Mike, maybe I'll throw that to you first. Sure. I would say probably no difference. Uh, To be honest, I think I would rather be contacted through, you know, email through social media before you show up at the office on a cold call. Uh, Mm -hmm. That doesn't go over too well. So uh, and I think probably with the pandemic we're 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 going through, I think that's probably uh, been driven home a lot uh, to people trying to sell. Uh, So, yeah, I would I. Yeah, I I think uh, I put more more on. and, And I think also when they reach me through social media, when they reach me through, whether it's LinkedIn, email, uh, however, it, it's always nice to know that they've done some research about the company that, you know, that I represent. Uh, nothing's worse than they they reach out to you, they misspell your company's name, they, uh, it, you could tell it's just almost like a checklist versus a, this is truly something that I want to uh, invest Stay with you as a partnership. And uh, if it's not worth the time to do that at the front end, is it really worth our time to even go further? So hope that answered your question. I, th- I think I chased a little rabbit there. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, I think, you know, if you spell my name G-I-N-A, it's you're getting deleted. You're out of my inbox. Right. I'm not going to entertain <laughs> it. It's D-E-N-A. And if you can't get that right, you're out. May, what about you? Did you find, do you find a difference in that in-person sale versus a virtual sale? Yeah, sure. You know, and again, this maybe illustrates like know your buyer, know, like really try to like have an idea of this person's personality. Right. So unlike Mike, I love seeing people in person. It definitely played um, to their advantage when I could put a face to a name. And it wasn't like, oh, I have somebody I could go back to if something goes wrong. Um, I know there are other channels for that. Um, Just your, you know, you're kind of like present for the pitch a little bit more, leaning in a little bit more. Plus, like, I loved it when people sent, you know, caramel popcorn and chocolate covered pretzels. Like, I live for that. Um, And I can't wait for goodie baskets. (laughs) Wow. That, I mean, that needs to be said to every salesperson ever. The more caramel popcorn we can get, the more chocolate we can get, the more you're going to get the sale. Absolutely. (laughs) Agreed. Agreed. (laughs) Um, on caramel popcorn for yourself like it just feels like extravagant right but somebody sending it yes. to you, like, yeah i'll take that mm-hmm. <laughs> and you and you remember them for sending you that and for making you feel good for 15 minutes until you then regret it after eating the whole 10 so okay, exactly um, um, <laughs> 
And then one other thing that you said, May, that was interesting about a product that you'd used in the past and, you, you know, you just wanted to revisit that. I know uh, our head of recruiting, when we brought him on board and, and said, we need a new applicant tracking system, he immediately went to what he had previously used, which was Lever. And while I love that, because what an easy implementation for our team, uh, we also kind of have a rule of thumb that you're not going to implement a new system unless we look at three different products mm -hmm. in that same vein so that we can, you know, compare and contrast. We can look at the pros and cons. We can weigh out, you know, what's going on and have a conversation, no matter how passionate you are about it. And so curious if either of you do something similar or uh, if you have a gut feeling and you're like, this is the one, if you just go with it. May, would you like to start on this one? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we don't, it's not a process per se. Um, you know, as soon as you said that, I was like, it really should be. Um, uh, what we like to ask people, and I just did this yesterday with like a customer success tool, is who do you all consider to be your competitors? Um, because, you know, they tend to give you like the honest answer. Uh, so, you know, fresh in the salesperson's mind who their competition is. Um, and often it's been like not a company that I've even heard of. And it's like, oh, yeah, maybe we should check those folks out. Um, and it gets to the why. OK, you know, I always love to ask um, as a follow up to that, you know, where you've lost. Why did somebody not choose your solution? Um, that also tends to be like a super honest answer. Um, and, you know, allows you to kind of make a decision on whether it even makes sense for, you know, us to go check out that other tool or not. Um, so, um, yeah, we don't have a process um, per se, but it is a team. You know, our team is like very speed oriented um, and very cost conscious. Those are sort of like the two things that are, you know, a startup's lifeblood. Um, so yeah. <laughs> that, um, you know, yeah, I, I, we don't have a policy per se, um, but we do like to know that we have kicked the tires around um, the, the various products in in this space. You know, that being said, I feel like, um, you know, we are ripe to be sold a culture management tool, <laughs> you know, like yeah. we are problem aware and solution aware, but sort of just, it, you know, in the hierarchy of needs, it just hasn't kind of risen up. Um, but I do think the like value to cost of some of those tools um, would be something that we would, um, you know, pursue. So I also think that like, um, you know, smaller companies, you know, should be ignored. Like we've got a lot of different rooms for different tools in our in our HR stack. Right. It's just they need to kind of be right sized for where we are, right priced for where we are. Sure. And Mike, how about you? You know, we really don't. Uh, to to May's point, we don't have a set in stone that you have to look at three. Uh, we always look at multiple, though. Anytime we make a decision, to make sure we're not just, uh, you know, we don't end up with buyer's remorse. The one thing that I do ask of anyone before we make a decision, I always ask to see the roadmap, their technical roadmap, uh, because mm -hmm. I want to know if they're innovating. Uh, if 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 we look at their roadmap and it's all fixes, and you know, it's great that they're making the fixes. But what's what's the innovation? Uh, because as we grow, as, te as we all know, technology, I mean, by next week, a lot of things will be obsolete and a uh, whole, whole slew of new things uh, will be in play. And, and so really I, looking and getting a peek at that roadmap to see where they're going, what they're doing, and, and, and are we going to be able to grow with them and grow together? Uh, that's one of the things that, that is a, a, it's a must once we get in that buying process and begin comparing. Great, and, and it looks like we have a question here. I want to remind everybody as well, there's also a poll um, that you can take. But the question is, what other HR software features aren't as important to buyers as they might seem? For example, May said that mobile wasn't necessarily important to them, but it was important to Mike's team. Um, I think, you know, off the top of my mind, I would say that, um, Depending on the system, you know, there are certain products where plug and play isn't what I want. Like for our human capital management system, I wanted it to be completely customizable. And I didn't want something that any company in, in the U.S. could use that had a thousand employees. I wanted something that was customizable. But I think that that varies by software. Um, May, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I feel like... Um some of the solutions were really emphasizing um, kind of international employees. And, and the reality is that if you can't handle like multiple different 
con types of contracts, multiple different holidays and multiple different like payroll systems, then I can't use you for that anyway. And so, you know, and I know this is tough. Like we also, you know, um, are a startup. And so I, I do understand like having only some of the features that you need to be able to do a certain something. But I remember being like a little annoyed, like, you know, I still will have to use remote.com. So please don't try to sell me this, you know, because like you don't have the whole thing to get this job done. So, you know, if you know that something is only halfway there, don't don't push it, you know, let them know, be upfront. Like, you know, this is part of a roadmap to Mike's perspective. Um, if you want an 80 20, we're not quite there, but you can get a 60 40. If you use it right now, we should be at 80 20 in a bit. Um, and that, you know, don't go for the hard sell if it's not, yeah. you know, that's not fully baked. Mike, do you have any thoughts on this one? Uh, kind of back to what, what you said, which is, again, uh, customizable. I think there are, I can't think off the top of my head just because we did build it uh, pretty customized. We customized what they sold uh, and it was not out of the box. Uh, but I think, again, making it customizable so that we're not being bogged down with all those things that maybe we don't use uh, at that time. Yeah. Great. And we have a couple more awesome questions I want to get to um, before we wrap the session. We have about I think, seven minutes left. So, um, Mike, have you ever switched vendors when you weren't already looking to make a change? How did somebody sharing blind spot insights lead to that sale? Sure. And it wasn't with an HCM system. It was with uh, uh, a tele telephony system. Uh, what it was, we were on a, a system that uh, we knew we were getting close to outgrowing. Uh, and the blind spots really came down to reporting, data warehouse. Uh, they were able to show us how ha if we stayed on that solution, we weren't going to be able to really grow and get the, the reporting that we were going to need to. Uh, and so I think that's where that blind spot, were we in the market? At that moment, no. We knew we were, at some point we were going to have to be in the market. But by somebody coming and telling us, okay, these are your blind spots that you're going to get pretty soon, it really made us sit down and make a decision probably quicker than we would have. Uh, because, you know, let's go ahead and get it done. That way we're not, we're not at the place where it becomes so crucial that we end up losing business or, or you know, we outgrow it and, and, and we start seeing problems out of it. May, have you ever um, switched vendors yeah. that you weren't already looking to make a change? Would you like to share that? Yeah, um, it was Namely, actually. So Namely had been reaching out, kind of educating our team. And, you know, I guess they knew that, like, Michael was the gusto person um, about what we could do with benefits um, if, if we moved. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was that was definitely driven by a great salesperson who really understood you know, like beyond health and, and dental and vision, um, you know, savings, retirement, life insurance um, and all these things that we ended up adding by virtue of being on uh, moving to Namely. That's great. And I think along those lines, one last question that came in was, what are your thoughts around employee benefits, health and retirement, for example? So I'm not sure if this question is asking around, you know, the sale of those products. Um, but feel free to interpret however you'd like. Mike, I don't know if you'd like to take this one. Sure. To me, we our culture is uh, really embracing our receptionist. We being a, a, a call center, a telephone answering service. Uh, we operate an upside down pyramid where our CEO considers herself at the bottom. And and it's really the, the frontline receptionists that are the rock stars. And and so we embrace and want to make sure they're covered in every aspect of life, you know, both here and uh, and, and at home. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we we recently made a decision to consolidate all of our uh, health and dental benefits in the U.S. and, and we're shopping uh, and made a decision uh, based on on where we wanted to go with them. We ended up paying a little more out of pocket with the U.S. I think health and benefits is such a hard area because if you're already with someone, you get discounts without having to go through audits and everything else that you don't if you switch. And we all know with the uh, with with insurance in the U.S., it's, uh, you know, I think last year there was a possibility of up to 21 percent increase year over year if we went elsewhere. And it, it that is a hard, hard one to talk about. Uh, but again, it's it's something that every company wants to embrace. And what sets a lot of companies apart is 
what they offer and how much they offer and how much they pay. And so I think it's always going to be a difficult subject within the uh, the HR space and the, the operations space. On I think we might oh might have lost you for a second, Mike. Okay, am I back? You're you're back. Yep. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, again, I think that's something that did I miss it again? Okay. I'm a no, you're here. We're good. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you you answered it great. And you know what? We only have three minutes, and I want to ask this one question, and I want to make sure that everybody who's attending and listening um, has an opportunity to visit both of your profiles and connect with you on LinkedIn, reach out to you. Um, so please, everybody, take some time after the session to do that. But last question, I think it's such a great one. Uh, May, I'll start with you, and and that is what platform product service do you not have that you wish you did whether it's not even created or you just don't have it for budgetary reasons but uh what does that platform product or service look like to you yeah i would love to be able to help people like get a babysitter or get their house deep cleaned or not have to worry about meals for a week you know like what are the cool like the element of surprise and serendipity, like 10 X is the joy versus like, oh, yeah, my company does all of it for me all the time. Um, I'd love to be able to really, you know, reward people um, and have managers be able to like very quickly, you know, get people things that give them back more free time and more time to like recharge. What we do is so hard for, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day, depending on the day. Um, it can be draining and, you know, to then have to turn around and empty your dishwasher like um, and, you know, I don't want to like, you know, coddle people, um, um, you know, that's not like our culture either. But it really, I think, would be nice to be able to reward employees um, with non-monetary things and benefits and give that kind of discretion to the managers. Like, you know, we've got a sprint week and this has to be done at the end of April. Like nobody needs worry about meals at home this week you know yes yes i love that and that's uh, really these new generations i believe what they want are the things that they remember and the way it made them feel not an extra 500 hundred dollar bonus they want to remember when they didn't have to clean their house for a week because you gave them a cleaning service and somebody came and cleaned their house for them during sprint week um or they got to go on a cool excursion and a trip that was totally paid for and they got to swim with some dolphins or something so um, yeah. love that answer. Mike, two minutes. Uh, what products do you wish you had? Oh my gosh. I'm going to go with what May said. I <laughs> am, I'm taking that away. If I take nothing else away from today, I'm taking that away. It, it's to your, it's to your point. It's, oh. it's, we always want to touch our employees hearts. And unfortunately, most of the time, what gets offered out there is cheap swag. I mean, I, I, I Maybe speaking on turn, slap my hand, but you know it, it's something that doesn't mean anything long term. And I love what you said, May. I, 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 it's something that makes a difference in their lives, and I think that's what we all want to do as people managers. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm going to agree with May and say, please, if you offer that, I will take your call. I have to tell you both, there is a company called Blueboard that you should look up. That they do something really similar to that. So check them out. Um, I don't work for Blue Board. They just, I was working with that. They pitched to me about a year ago. So check them out. But um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Please connect with Mike, with May, with myself. Um, thank you for your questions and engagement. And um, I hope you all have a great day. Thank Bye, you, Gina. Everybody. Thank you, May. Gina, thanks, Mike. So nice to talk with you guys. Bye.